Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited today to have uh, two legends with me, Ryan Hawk and Brooke Cups. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, this is this is such an opportunity uh, and an honor for me because I have so much respect for both of you guys. We all live in Centerville, which is kind of our, our hometown, our home community. Um, but I, I always like to kind of start with a macro. You guys have done a lot. Ryan, we'll start with you. I'm kind of curious, how would you describe the calling that God has placed on your life? Oh, man. Um, I think of my purpose, which is to inspire others to both value and pursue excellence. And I just try to live that out each day. And I think my core values, all of this coached in, uh, into me and, and helped from Brooke here. That's why I was so pumped to get to spend a couple of years together writing a book together. But really, it's like my values and serve the purpose. And my purpose is how I try to show up for other people in the world. And um, I'm kind of a prompt driven person when it comes to writing and thinking and acting, uh, behaving. So it's really just thinking about how did I live up in an alignment with with my values each day. And I can ask myself those questions at the end of the days. And, you know, hopefully, there are more days where I'm, I'm, I'm living up to them than not. And if so, then I feel like things will go pretty well. And um, but first, first and foremost, starts with getting very clear on that. And that's a process that's hard. And it's messy. And it's tough. And, um, and hopefully, you know, our work can can help people do that. Brooke, what about you? Same question? Yeah, I mean, I think of it as God created everybody differently, um, everybody with their own set of strengths. And what we do, and what we try to uncover for people is what those are, like, how did God create you unique? And how can you contribute the most to, you know, I, I think ultimately, our our role as people in the world is to glorify God and, and serve. And so I think we do that best when we are in tune with who we are and who we were created to be. And so um, I believe strongly kind of what Ryan said is like, we each have a purpose. We each have values that, that are unique to us. And, you know, the goal of what we're doing is trying to help people understand that and whether they're connected to Christ or not right now, um, our hope is that it leads them there if, it, if they're not already there like that it makes it clear makes the connection better and allows them the opportunity to grow in their faith through that one of the things i really enjoyed about the writing is that the way that you guys kind of interwove your voice your individual voices and your corporate voice in the book um you tell a story in the book about how you guys met as uh ryan coming into the leadership class that you teach at the high school brook uh I, when did you guys know that this was more than just a casual friendship, but uh, to use your term, foxhole friend. Brooke, we'll, we'll let you start with this one. Uh, you know, when I reached out to Ryan, I really had no idea if he would even respond. And so I'm just, I was like, oh, I mean, I've been told no a lot of times. So what's another time? Right. So I just shot him an email in hopes that he would reply. And then, you know, when he came and talked to the leadership class, I mean, I knew right away, like he was somebody that I wanted to, I wanted to try to connect with and learn from, um, just from his experiences and all the conversations he had had. And so, um, I mean, it was pretty quick, pretty quick for me, um, in terms of wanting to grow our relationship and, you know, get to know him a lot better. Ryan, what about you? Uh, I think one of the things you notice quickly about Brooke is, how comfortable he is in his own skin. And I think that is an amazingly rare quality. And I am very attracted to people like that. Uh, I want people like that in my life. There aren't a lot of them. And uh, I'm not one of them, not yet. I think I'm kind of along that path, but not like as far along as, as Brooke is. And so uh, being around people like that uh, can I, th I think, I think can, can level you up. It can help you get to a place where you want to go. So I would say almost immediately, um, through our conversations. And then it's funny, uh, Tim Urban has this great visual on, um, <laughs> 
if you if you think highly of somebody, the more you get to know them, you'll actually think worse. And if you hate somebody, the more you get to know them, you'll actually like them better. So you always end up kind of in the middle. If we could pop up that chart, if you clip this, it would be funny to see. But anyways, uh, but there are some exceptions to that rule. And I'd say a couple people in my life who are exceptions. Uh, one, one, the first one that I think of is my wife, Miranda, who the more I get to know her, the more I, I like her which you have to, I think, both love and like your wife. It makes it a lot better. Uh, and I would say there are a few others, but Brooke is definitely one of those two, that the more I get to know, the more I actually like and appreciate. And so, you know, it starts off good. I enjoyed being with him in his, in his class and, and, the, and the group he had me speak with. Um, I asked him to speak at one of my events. He initially didn't want to do it, not because he was being a, a – a, a guy who just wanted to deny me, but he he didn't think he'd have value to bring, which was just a absolutely crazy. Uh, he came and spoke, and I appreciated the first thing we're doing is like standing up, doing these crazy handshakes, and he just went for it. And I also admire people who just go for it. You know, like what the hell? Like this is my thing. Like I'm just gonna go for it. And I thought that was pretty cool. And and ever since after that moment, I would say he joined one of my circles. And has been a you know a friend and 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 uh and somebody i go to for ever since then that was what 2017 2018 ish so um yeah that's rare that's rare but when you find them you know for me i'm going to do everything i can to invest in those relationships and hopefully you know that we're, we're we both can be transformational friends for one another and, and by definition a transformational friend changes you and i like i like people like that one of the things i notice when i work with leaders is that a lot of them struggle from loneliness. And so this is kind of a, a strange question to ask. It may even be a little unfair, but do you guys have any thoughts on where you go to find transformational friends? Go ahead, BC. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's a, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think that's a, I mean, I think you've got to look for them in arenas that you're, that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. I think that's important because you, like, and I think, I think you make the mistake, you make a mistake if you look at people that are necessarily high achievers. I think you've got to pay attention to how people do what they're doing. And so get in the arena that you that you're passionate about for me, like leadership, basketball, like competition in general, sports, things like that. Like, so I'm always kind of looking in those areas. And then like who's doing it the right way or what I see as the right way and really challenging themselves and pushing the, their standard and kind of overachieving. Like those are the people that I, I think tend to lead themselves to be transformational. So I, I just, I still think it kind of comes back to what we wrote a lot, a lot about in the book is it's more about the process that someone is undertaking rather than the result they're getting right now. Ryan, anything you want to, to answer, there? Tony? Well, if you got anything, I don't know. Well, I think I think part of what's been helpful for me that just to, I mean, I agree with everything Brooke said, but part of part of what's helped me is I think you actually have to like do something that's useful or helpful for others, and it will attract people to you, and then it it, it creates more like surface area for luck, like more opportunities to meet amazing people. There's this great quote that I shared recently with my Mindful Monday that I read that I'm like, oh, this makes sense to me. If you, it says, if you spend your time chasing butterflies, they'll fly away. But if you spend your time making a beautiful garden, the butterflies will come. And to me, that's like, I, if I consistently ship really good work, it seems like this, that's why Brooke sent me a cold email one day. If I hadn't been shipping any work, he doesn't email him. There's no reason to email me, right? He's not going to email me because I played quarterback a thousand years ago at the high school where he teaches. Those kids don't care about that. They've never heard of me. They weren't even born. So, so it's really about doing good work that then attracts those types of people to you. And, and certainly you still have to have a good picker and you have to be – uh, I think choosy be, be, between that, but like I think of the people that I'm closest with when it comes to excellence and uh, personal improvement, a lot of them have come as a result of me shipping useful work and then they've said they want to talk. I mean, it's it's kind of wild now that I'm I'm really reflecting on it that that's helped. So maybe a little bit different angle, but if you do things that are useful and helpful for other people, you'll probably attract 
those types to you and then you can kind of make those decisions of which ones you'd like to hang out with well so that leads me to my next question right as i was listening to you guys talk about this is there's a you guys have both had are having tremendous careers right you're still in the middle of it and i've had the privilege of watching you both how do you guys determine your right yeses and your right no's like ryan when somebody call you know somebody like brooke sends you a cold email and how do you say yeah what's kind of the matrix that you go through to say yes or no to to so many opportunities um in his particular case i remember it because it was very well written and it was very specific and there was a direct ask it helps that he's from centerville um but so that that made it an easier yes. Uh, I I really value specificity with somebody. I had, I did not know who Brooke was though at the time. I I even though I live in the community, I hadn't really gone to any football or basketball games in years. I just you know you get your own kids and you just go to all their stuff, and th- that's the only priority. There aren't priorities when it comes to like sporting events when you have your own kids. So I was like completely out of the game. And then when I get there, and I think was it Puckett or others, another coach pulled me aside and they said, <clears throat> I'd already kind of been impressed with Brooke after I met him. And, and he's like, you know, he was, he's coached, you know, he's like hand selected by LeBron James to cloak, to coach the blue chips team that his son also plays on. I was like, what? And I, and I'm like, he never told me any of this stuff. And most people would lead with stuff like that. And so when I find someone like that, I'm like, Oh, like, yeah, I, those are the type, like everyone leads with all this stuff. Oh, you should watch my son. He's amazing. Watch my daughter play. They're amazing. I didn't know Brooke even had a son, you know, when I met him. I didn't know that he coached with LeBron James, like literally sitting side by side. And I, and I think, oh, okay. I, yes, those like are the ones that I want to be around that they just kind of let their stuff do the talking for them. They don't brag, they don't bring it up. And that's like a, that was a really good, I remember at the time, like a really good indicator. I was walking down the hall at Centerville High School, I believe it was Coach Puckett who said those things to me. And I thought, oh, interesting. And then it kind of got even better from there. Brooke, any thoughts from you on on how you say yes and no? I mean, obviously you're managing a lot with a basketball team, a whole program, you know, your own family. What are your, what's your matrix? Yeah. I, first, I was I was going to say like Ryan's answer to the last question is this is exactly how our book came. Like we, I gave an answer that I, I thought of, and then I hear Ryan's answer, which was way way better. And so like <laughs> Ryan's answer would be what was in our book. Like that's how we ended up with like a I think a decent book is because we both kind of try to answer stuff and we're like, whoa, that's way better. And so that iron <laughs> it's, a, it's, iron a good, so it's a good just, book. It's a good book. It's a good book. You don't have to say decent. It's good. I appreciate that. Yeah. It was a messy so, process. No, that, to get that reminded me. Anyway, I, I don't want to yeah. go, go, go ahead, dude. I'm it just was. saying the, the book process is insane, as you know, Tony, but uh, I'm, I'm happy with where we're at, but we'll never be like fully content. I think it's amazing just because I think that's a natural way we view our stuff. Cause it's always like evolving and, and, and we have to go back now and even remember some of the stuff we've written because we're always like updating our thinking and there's new stuff. So, but books are like a, a permanent artifact. It's one of the only things that are like that. That's what make them weird. It's like, Oh, we can't really update it. It's like, we have the copies now and that's that. And, but we're always kind of updating our thoughts, but sorry, go ahead, Brooke. No. So, so my, and Ryan and I've talked a lot about this. My, mine is always my core values. So I just filter everything through my core values. So if it makes me tougher, more passionate, more unified or more thankful, or if it elevates those within our team, it's a yes. If it doesn't, it's a no. And it just, that's just it. I mean, I, that's kind of how I run my life, how I make my decisions. Um, you know, my purpose is to inspire others to strive for excellence over success. So for me, excellence is that is, is like those, your values and your purpose, like what God has put into you living to that, to that audience of one, rather than to the comparison that everybody else wants to, to base success on. So, um, if it'll allow me the opportunity to do that and to inspire others to, to be closer to excellence rather than success, then I'm, I'm in. If not, I'm out. One of the interesting things about both of you guys is that you're movement leaders in very different ways. 
right? And so Ryan, obviously with the podcast and the learning leader circles and the speaking events and kind of the work you do and creating transformation amongst leaders. And then, and then Brooke, it's, it's wild to hear you talk about your values because as someone who lives in Centerville, everyone in Centerville knows your values. If they're at all, even a little bit associated with, with basketball, um, they know your values. Like we talk about stealing inches in my house all the time, right? Because, you know, we've, we've gone through the, the process, you know, we've, we've played basketball, right. And, and still playing, you know, for my yeah. middle son. Right. So, so let me ask you this, Brooke, as a movement leader, um, how do you, how do you carry that responsibility of knowing that there's a large group of people who, when you say your values, they're, they're being changed by that. Like, what's that like for you internally? Um, I don't really think about that very often. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's not really about me and how I feel about it. I'm like, I tell everybody as far as our program goes, you know, my values don't have to be your values and really they shouldn't. You need to figure out your own values. I just think if you're part of the basketball program, you need to appreciate my values and, sure. and think that they can help you grow and mature and become closer to yours. Uh, but I think that's a lesson in, in life, like picking a job, like don't work at some place that don't match your values. Like you, you're going to be miserable, find a job that, you know, that aligns with who you are and what you believe. And so my, my stance in terms of how I think about it personally, I mean, honestly, I just, I don't like, I don't really take any of that stuff internalized much of that at all. I just, just, that's who I am. And like, I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't have a good answer for that. But no, that's, that's actually a great answer, right? Because what you're essentially talking about is you just live your values and people can get on board if they want to get on board. And that's, that's kind of that. Um, you guys talk about it in the book, that externally driven scoreboard or the internally driven scoreboard, your internally driven scoreboard is not no one else in the world. It sounds like it, you know, probably maybe outside of your foxhole and family right? Have permission to put points on the board for you. And man, what a, what a great place to be in. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to nuance the question a little bit for you because you, you know, at this point in your career, you've influenced tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of leaders through the podcast and the content you create. How do you wrestle with that responsibility or, or do you kind of take the same approach as Brooke? Uh, one of the things I'm probably not very good at is uh, thinking like super long term strategically, uh, I really think about the next interview, the next speech, the next whatever the next thing that I'm doing and being overly prepared. Uh, I definitely suffer from productive paranoia, which, um, it, you know, the word productive is a part of that. Jim Collins coined that term and great by choice, but I think, um, yeah, I, I don't think much about it other than other than like, how can I do the best possible interview I can do for the next one? And then the next one and then the next one or how can I give everything I have for that next keynote or the next circle meeting, whatever it is, I don't really think much beyond that or even like the impact I, I have seen though, when I can focus on enduring and being consistent and being overly prepared good things seem to happen. Like the score takes care of itself. It seems to when I focus on that and just be really, really like maniacal about preparation for the next thing. And if I do that, like amazing opportunities just keep coming. They keep happening like more than we can even do. So um, that, that's, that's kind of like a, a signal, I guess, like, Hey, maybe this is the right way just, just to be overly prepared for the next thing. And then to, I think consistency is just, I mean, it's one of my core values, but it's also um, a really big deal when it comes to building trust with an audience of people who are following you. And so if they know, oh, this guy has shipped his thing every Sunday for nine years at seven o'clock Eastern, I can trust him. I believe in him and, and, and his stuff can become part of my routine when I'm washing the dishes after dinner on Sunday night or walking on Monday mornings or commuting to work or whatever, working out. 
that is another big deal to me. So like if I live out that consistency value, it seems like it helps like impact people in a positive way. And then it also then creates really cool opportunities for me. So I just try to like, just keep doing that. And fortunately, like, I love it. Like I love doing that. So like, that's a big help because if I, it was a grind or I didn't like it, or I didn't enjoy preparing quietly sitting here in my studio, just like reading, I don't, it, it probably wouldn't work, but I actually like enjoy that stuff and writing an outline and thinking about questions and thinking about how I'm going to open the next speech. Like all that stuff's fun, man. Like it's enjoyable. So I feel really fortunate that like that, that's the thing. So I, I really like one of my big motivations is like keep doing a good job so that I get mm-hmm. to keep doing this stuff. Can I ask you about something really specific and weird that I saw you wrestle with publicly? I, yeah, yeah, you're here. You're the host. <laughs> We're here. We're here. I don't know yeah. if I'll give you a good answer, but yeah. you can ask. <laughs> well, so I, I saw recently uh, as a as somebody who subscribes to your podcast, you were really wrestling what to do with uh, guests who curse. Yeah. Right. And you put it out there. You took some feedback. You, there, I mean, it, so many people commented on it. I was amazed by the level of engagement. Could, could you talk to a little bit about how you wrestled through that process about how you're going to serve your community and how you're going to um, stay consistent with your values? Well, the feedback was awesome. It was it was really funny. Our mutual friend, Garen Stokes, probably gave me the best feedback. I think, Brooke, you were on that text. Um, I won't repeat what he said, but it was really good. No, the, I got I got all varying, varying degrees of things of people said to me. I ultimately decided... I just didn't want to edit my guests. Like if I ask you to come on my show, I'm not going to tell you what to say or what not to say. We still edit our podcast, but, but only for like, if I ask a really long, stupid question, we might cut that. Or if I, or or if the guest does something like that, we may trim that down, but we're not going to edit for language. Cause I just want, if somebody likes to talk that way, like, I don't care. I think that's fine. I want them to show up as authentically as they actually are. So really that's, that was, I, I, it became a bigger deal. I shouldn't have probably made it as big of a deal as it was. I ultimately, I, I really just said, I just want guests to kind of say what they want to say, and I'm not going to edit their voice. And, and, and that makes it a more authentic conversation. I would never, I don't think I'd go into a lunch conversation and say, Tony, you can only, you can't say these words. You can only say these words. I, I would never tell you what to say. I would just, you say what you say, and then we listen. So That's what I try to make the podcast feel like is two people meeting for lunch, becoming friends, and you get to sit at the the table next to us. And so that's what you hear with some, again, like minor editing that hopefully just makes the conversation like, I don't know, a little more enjoyable. Um, But yeah, there are some people who say they won't listen because uh, of the language. I I mark them explicit if there are. Sometimes I give a a disclaimer if somebody like Nikki Glaser is going to drop the C word and other things on my show. It happens sometimes, you know, I got, you know, I was surprised that the criticism from that one in particular, but Hey, like I have wide and wide. I thought that was an incredible interview. Oh, well, you're, you're in the minority, dude. Uh, (laughs) I, 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 which is fine though. Like that was for me. Like I I was, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it too. Like I had fun. I don't, I don't want to only have the same old white guy. Give me like leadership theories Mm -hmm. for the last 40 years. Like I have enough of those. I don't want to have that's, I get bored. Like I need to have more diverse and interesting people and so um sometimes sometimes you know you're gonna get criticized for that which is fine it's okay uh ultimately the show is a leadership program phd program for myself i like the fact that others seem to want to learn along with me though brooke how often do you guys check in with each other when you're up against uh we'll call it a tough decision maybe it's something like this that's professional ryan mentioned the group text but how how often do you check in with your foxhole friends Oh man, it kind of depends on what's going on, but I would say a, a few times a week, normally. And now, right now, it's daily because a lot of the a lot of people that um, were were kind of involved in some different things that are going on. So we have conversations kind of ongoing. But um, in a in a time where we're not um, engaged in something, I, I would say two or three times a week. I'm I'm usually checking in with my foxhole people. I also wanted to ask you a question uh, about parenting. Uh, You recently sent a son off to college. Um, By all accounts, you guys have been, you and and Gabe have been super close. Um, You know, I'm in a season where I'm sending, this is, by the way, this is a question strictly for me. 
Uh, I don't care if anybody else likes it. To Ryan's point, how, 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 did, how did you wrestle with the loss of those daily touches with with your son, right? And Connor and I have that similar relationship where we, specifically in the morning, like people are like, what are you going to miss most? I'm going to miss 5 a.m. where we're both trying to get ready to do what we're going to do for the day and miss those moments. How, how have you managed that and what tips do you have for the rest of us? Um, yeah, you know, it's, we talk about it in the book, it's garbage time that you miss the most, you know, what people, what people act like isn't important. That's definitely what you miss. Um, I think, I think just, you're, you're still staying in touch with them like that. That's helped me. I stay in touch with Gabe. I talk to him every day, either through text or a uh, phone call. Um, and then just keeping in perspective that like, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Like, they're not meant to stay in your house their whole life. Like you, you prepared them. Like we went through a lot of uh, great stuff and a lot of hard stuff together. Um, so I just try to remain grateful more than anything. Just, just maintain kind of a heart of gratitude and just appreciating, you know, the opportunity to go watch him play basketball and the opportunity to talk to him and the opportunity to, for him to tell me the stuff that's going on. And, you know, just, uh, just all those things that, you, you know, but you've got to keep at the front of your mind or else you get sucked into like I, all the things that you miss. And, you know, there's great things happening now too that five years from now you'll look back on and be grateful for. So yeah. just trying to stay present with that stuff and, and remind yourself. Well, gratitude is one of the major themes of the book. Uh, Ryan, I, I appreciated the part, one of the parts that you kind of wrote about when it, it came to your family values and how you're leading your family and how you start off with a ton of values and then trying to simplify how has the value-based approach impacted your family unit? Um, I mean, it's, it's a core for how I try to show up every day as a leader. I think the number one job is it the number one job. I don't know. I think a really important role as a dad and a husband is uh, to be the right model. Um, when I think about my parents, that's what they did and continue to do to this day is kind of model the behaviors of being, especially my dad as like an excellent husband, as a very present dad. Um, I think I think that one's so big of like presence of just showing up of being there, like whatever it is, there's a lacrosse game that's 45 minutes away, but it's one of those 20 minute off season games where the drive is longer than the game you know, on a late Sunday night, you just, you just got to go, man. Right. Like that's, you just got to be there. You show up, just give them a high five and a hug after the game. Proud of you. You love you, you know, that type of stuff. So I, I, to me, like, I, I, I just, I, I just, again, prompts are in my mind. Like how, how did I show up as being thoughtful or thankful? How did I leave people placed in things better than I found them, which is the core behavior, critical behavior for my, my thankful value. So like, that's really how, how I kind of design everything. It's not just as a dad, but it's just kind of like in general, because I don't like you really flip a switch from a leadership perspective. You kind of just are, and you have to figure out like what, what are the things most important to you and then living those out each day. So I, I think of myself first and foremost as just the model for what I hope. Um, and I just have to be that. And then, you know, certainly you have conversations and there are things that happen because kids don't make, always make the right decisions and they make mistakes and things happen. And I get really frustrated at times, but, but, at, but the, at the end of the day, like my job is to lead our family. And so I'm, I'm just trying hard first and foremost to model those behaviors that are important to me, my values, and they'll have their own values, but I want them at least to see me living mine out. Have you started working with your kids yet on their values? Like what, where's the right age range on that kind of? Yeah. I thoughts? mean, if we've had conversations, but I also get a lot of eye rolls. I get made fun of a lot, like a lot. It is very easy to be humble when I'm at home. Um, that happened. Brooks had experience with some of those from in school detention and things like that. Like it is very, like I got a nice new spray tan. I get made fun of for it, but it looks great. I feel great. I don't care. <laughs> you know, like what, why not? You know? So, uh, like I'm just used to like mainly being made fun of. And I think that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, things I didn't think we were going to talk about today. Ryan. Spring. Well, Brooke knows okay, it's good. coming up. Like he knows she, Addison couldn't wait to go tell him like, you know, my dad's spray tan and does all this stuff. And, and, I, and I'm like, Hey, we can't all be naturally beautiful. Like some of these people in the world. So we do what we got to do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 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 Brooke, do you do you have any marital disciplines that you and <laughs> Betsy do in order to stay connected on values, like and and being aware of how to serve her in her value base? I'm always curious about. Like, I like to steal good parenting and good marriage stuff anytime I can. Yeah, you know, it, I think it it all is the same. Just what Ryan was saying, I what I want my kids and my wife to see is authentic me. I, I want them to see the real me. And I, you know, my dad grew up with an alcoholic father. And I think back to stories that he told and things that I know about that. And, and what he didn't know was what he was getting when he got home every day. Mm. I had no idea if dad was going to be chill or dad was going to be beating up mom. Like he, he didn't have a clue. And so I want, I want my kids to like know who's coming home, know who's sitting and playing, know who's going to the games. And I want them to have the, have the courage to be that. I think, I think instilling courage in your kids is such an important thing. And the most courageous thing you can be is true to who you are. And, and I think just being that over and over. And I think the same thing, um, the example I want to, you know, I think I'm a better husband when I'm tough, passionate, unified, and thankful. I'm a better father. And so I think that creates the best environment for Betsy and I um, to to live a life of, you know, of appreciation for each other and to serve, um, you know, our kids and be be who they need us to be, too. That's really well stated. Um, one of the interesting things about this writing that I've not seen before when it comes to values and process-based goals is the introduction of imagery into the uh, value process. Can you talk a little bit about uh, imagery and how important that is in your process of establishing values? Go ahead, Ryan, you take the ethos stuff. Okay. Uh, I, I love our, I love the ethos exercise, Tony, uh, Brooke and I have done it a lot. I've done it on my own, uh, outside of our time together. It seems to always work really. Um, it just brings the, your values to life by selecting images that represent you. And so like for mine, the, uh, the hawk, the edge and the stairs, um, how it brings to life, the fact that a hawk has to be very thoughtful and also patient and gliding around and then when it decides on its it has, uses its eyes so it has to be a professional noticer of things to look around and see what's out there but then when it decides it commits with like a hundred percent commitment to go after whatever it decides to commit to and i think that's a great metaphor for for me for how I need to be is like always scanning and noticing what's going on in the world. Noticing things is really important as Seth Godin said years ago. Um, and then making a hundred percent commitment is huge that, that sometimes it's easier to make like kind of a commitment and not be fully there. Mm. So uh, I could go through all of mine, but, but I, I when I p showed that picture of a hawk and then I talk through it briefly, like, boom, you got to know me as a leader a lot quicker in like 60 seconds than you did before. And so we like to have all leaders create their ethos, their, their imagery to back up and bring their values to life, bring them to life. I just did this last week with a, a pretty sizable room and I had the CEO go and multiple other people go and they'd worked together in some cases for more than a decade. And there were multiple people who said, oh, I didn't know that about you. I didn't really. That's interesting. Oh, and then there's always laughs too. It's always funny. Like it's just, it just, it works every time because I think it just brings important things to life that people haven't fully thought about. And, and so, uh, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in like the imagery because it is also very memorable. Oh yeah. You're the guy who has the, the hawk thing, or you're the person who says they're the, the, whatever, um, that comes up quite a bit too. So uh, uh, to me, uh, this is an exercise that, that we, we've certainly had a lot of fun with and it's been super impactful. Brooke, would you mind sharing your imagery too, just so uh, it's out there? Yeah, a wolf, an ax in the arena. 
So Wolf for me is like the kind of the unified, um, you know, unified is like, I, I don't see myself as a lion or a tiger. I, there's a little quote, I always say like lions and tigers are in the circus, but you don't, you don't see a wolf in the circus, do you? Like wolf's going to do their thing. Like they're going to be wolves, right. And they're going to be in their pack. They're going to do their thing together. And I always just see myself as a, as way, way better in, as part of a team. Um, and that's kind of what I think of when I think of a wolf, the, the axes, the tough and the work and just the consistency. We always chop down a tree before our season. And we talk about just, you know, like it's not the first swing. It's usually not the 200 swing. You just got to keep swinging and just so you keep showing up that consistency piece. And the arena is more about the judgment of others and approaching thing with no fear, detaching from man's approval um, and, and being thankful and grateful for the opportunities. One of the things I know about um, my podcast family is that they love to pray, right? And so as this book gets put out into the wilderness and as it as it goes out to all of the leaders who are going to pick it up, uh, Ryan, we'll start with you. W what can we pray uh, for this book as it goes out there? Uh, I mean, I hope, I, I, my hope for it is that um, people actually read it uh, I've noticed people buy books more than they read them. And so I certainly want people to buy it, but I, I want them to read it. Um, and then we put exercises at the end of each chapter to take action on, on what you're, you're reading, what you're learning. It's not enough just to read something and think about it, but it's, it, it doesn't really work if you don't put it into action and, and do something about it. I think that's how transformation happens. You have to make it happen. So, so yeah, my, my hope is that you actually read it and uh, put, put something into action so that you show up better for yourself as well as everybody else that you're leading. And if, if that happens, I mean, that there's some real transformation. That would be amazing. If we get an email a year from now from people and they say, you know, implemented this and it's, it's really changing my life or it's changed my life, that that would be a massive win. And it's, it's some of the early readers that we sent it to. It's, it's neat to see that, like, there are some, like, executive coaches and people I've sent it to. I'm like, you're welcome to share it with your clients, things like that. I just got a note, like, an hour before this podcast where, you know, like a CEO who's being coached by this executive coach changed his life. I mean, how cool is that, man? Like, that's the coolest thing ever. That's why you, you know, you, you do things like this is to help people and impact them. So that's, that's my hope for it. Brooke, what about you? Yeah, exact same thing. Stir, stirred to change, to to reflect, to change, to you know become the person that they were created to be, and uh, you know just like that. That's why I always say coaching and teaching is like the greatest profession in the world because I'll get that text from seven years ago, you know, and, and just from being a coach, and you know the book I think has the opportunity to hopefully you know, have that same ripple effect, a ripple effect, I hope to where, you know, it's it somewhat makes somebody a better father, a better friend, a better husband, a better wife. Um, so that's the, that's the hope. That's the prayer. I love that. And I think, uh, we can easily pray that along with you guys. Um, okay. So I have one more question to ask you, but before I do, I know that, the uh, the podcast family is going to want to connect with you guys all over the interwebs. Where is the best place to learn all things, uh, the score that matters? Well, Brooks, a big social media guy, so you can connect. He's with him all there. over it. Hell LinkedIn. Yeah. He does well on LinkedIn. Okay. Do you run your own LinkedIn? <laughs> Somebody else do that for you? <laughs> I, no, I do that. I do that. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. That's all me. Uh, the marketing plan. I'm like, just take, take Brooks part I, don't, I mean if you do whatever you want but don't feel any obligation now uh, my stuff's at learningleader.com i i'm active on social media although i have hired some help because i hate it uh but uh but it's i understand for some of the stuff i do it's necessary so uh, i do like our clips and stuff though we got some good things coming out but yeah learningleader.com's there and all the book stuff's there amazon wherever barnes and nobles wherever you buy books uh it's available so hopefully you know, people want to buy it and actually read it. Brooke, is there, uh, we should talk about your blog. It's excellent. It comes out every Thursday. Uh, is that bluecollargrit.com? 
Yeah. Yeah. I just write it every Thursday. I post That's what I post on LinkedIn too. And uh, I am terrible on social media, not by uh, really by choice. Like I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to be good at it. And so I just, I just don't. It's pretty much it. I figure, you know, I, I'm not going to chase the butterflies. I'm going to just build the garden and let the butterflies mm. come to me. See what I did there, Hawk? Yeah. Look at this. <laughs> look at this. <laughs> great callbacks uh, here. This is great good. Great callback. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Last question I love to ask people. It's an advice question, except I'm going to ask you to go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, but I get to name the season of life that you're in. And as I kind of okay. thought about this for you guys specifically, um, I want to take you guys back to the the very first day that you met in person after the leadership class at Centerville. If you could go back in time and sit knee to knee with that younger version of yourself, hold uh, hold your hands, look them in the eye, and tell them one thing about what is to come. Like give them one piece of advice. Uh, what's the one thing you're going to ask them? Brooke, let's start with you. Um. What is, am I asking or am I telling them something? Telling them you're, yeah, you're going to give them one piece of advice. Yeah. Okay. My, my advice would be fortune favors the bold. Go mm. for it. I love that. Ryan, what about you? Wait, are we going back to 2017 now? Or are we going back yeah, to like 2017 high school? No, oh. 2017. Yeah. When you guys first met. Oh, um, yeah, I like I like that one a lot. I mean, I, the the one of the things that I learned from Brooke, I think he mentioned being a little bit nervous before that first time he spoke to my group, and then said, "Nah, uh, that living in my values, I can't I can't go like eighty percent. Like I gotta I gotta go. I gotta get a, give it all. Like I'm just gonna do it. And if they hate it, they hate it. If they don't like it, whatever. And so I think." especially now it is so much easier to kind of go for it mm. to kind of do like the b minus speech because it's safe or you can like actually actually like i'm giving it everything and and you risk looking stupid and risk it maybe people like not liking it but man like I want, I want, I aspire to be the one who's like, no, I'm just going to go for it. Like I'm going for it on, on this one. And yeah, there may be people who like laugh. That's okay. Like th that's okay. I'm just going to go for it. And when I do that, it seems to go much better as opposed to being a little scared. And so I'm like, yeah, let me just go and swing for like a single or a double. Cause I know I'll, I'll do it as opposed to saying like, I'm going to try to hit a homer. And, and when I do it, it, you're usually rewarded for that. Hmm. Guys, this has uh, been such a rich time. I deeply appreciate your generosity. There's about a thousand questions that I can get to, which is always a good sign of a great interview. So thank you for your wisdom and for your commitment to our community and, uh, and to helping leaders everywhere. Thank you, man. Appreciate your prep. Yeah. It was Thanks, obvious. Tom. You seem pretty, uh, you make this thing look pretty smooth and easy, dude. I appreciate it.